everyone. Welcome to another episode of Critical Conversations, where we talk about hot topic issues related to American Muslims and other targeted communities. Today we will talk about Bridge for Unity, an interracial dialogue project that seeks to build understanding across racial divides. To help us understand the various dimensions of this project, we are joined today by Dr. Paula Green, who is leading the facilitation and is a co-organizer with Deborah Snow. Dr. Green is also the founder of Karuna Center for Peacebuilding and Professor Emerita at the School for International Training. We are also joined today by Professor Shabazz, Professor Demetria Rujo Shabazz, who is a participant in the project and is also a lecturer of African American Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. She is also the president of the board of Amherst Media. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Pleasure. So Dr. Green, let me begin with you. We were sitting here last year talking about Hands Across the Hills, mm -hmm. which was another dialogue project that you led between conservatives from Letcher County, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and progressives from Leverett, Massachusetts. That project still continues, but you're right now in the middle of another project around race. What compelled you to talk about and focus on race for this particular dialogue series? Well, in one sense, we all should be talking about race <laughs> all the time. It's part of that, that's part of our obligation. It's part of my obligation as a white person who benefits from whiteness in this society. And it's part of the responsibility of all of us who live in this country. So that's the background for that. The specifics are that um, through the Hands, for, hands Across the Hills dialogue program, um, Deborah Snow, a, a friend from Montague, um, watched what we were doing, was very attracted to the dialogue model, and had connections in Beaufort County, South Carolina, with both black and white communities, and she got the idea that we take the model and apply it to race. So she was the one who instigated specifically that we do this particular mm -hmm. event, but the um, the thought behind it has been something that I've thought about for a long time sure. and worked on for a long time. Sure. And could you talk about how the project is structured and which communities are part of the dialogue? Yes, um, Deborah had the partnership with Beaufort County, South Carolina, and that was perfect for us. So we have partners in Beaufort County, South Carolina, and three of them from Charleston, South Carolina. The Massachusetts people are all from Western Mass, and we span from um, Springfield, Holyoke, Amherst, Northampton, way up to Shelburne Falls. So we span um, the, the, the whole valley. Um, both of the groups are predominantly um, European-descended Americans mm -hmm. and African-descended Americans. We also have two indigenous people in the Massachusetts group, one from Mexico and one from Wisconsin. Additionally, I want to keep Kentucky in the loop because it's important for them and their education and important for us. So I invited um, a few of the members who participated last time who were European Americans to bring some African Americans and join the group also. So it's actually a three-way dialogue with three very different experiences of being African American, being white American, and being indigenous American. Sure, and then the Massachusetts based group, that, mm -hmm. that, that meets on a regular basis? We meet monthly. We started to meet monthly um, in the beginning when we formed the, the uh, relationships, and we've continued to have our own dialogue every single month, focusing on our own relationships, sure. de de deepening our relationships, struggling to understand more about each other, to be build our trust with each other. And um, we did that before South Carolina, then we sort of came back and continued it again. And, and the model is intensive and immersive, both the three days that we have with each other and the time that we have each month. The South Carolina and Kentucky groups are coming to meet with us the last weekend in June. There'll be a public event in Springfield that I hope people will come to. Excellent, well thank you so much. And Professor Shabazz, before you became a participant in the dialogue, you were initially quite skeptical about joining this group and about the project itself. Could you talk us a little bit about what was behind that skepticism? Well, uh, to begin, I, I, even during the process, um, I'm skeptical. Mm -hmm. And initially, what was part of my uh, skepticism just in joining the process was that I have, uh, with a colleague in communication, also taught dialogue. And what I think is both challenging and powerful 
about it is that sometimes you're you're talking to the choir mm -hmm. so these are folks who have already bought into um, you know that we need to talk about race mm -hmm. we need to talk about our differences we need to bridge the gap um, and so you're not reaching necessarily another demographic group and that's a, a real difficulty mm -hmm. what is hopeful about dialogue however is that in having those conversations amongst folks that we say have bought in or are part of the choir that they will then utilize those skills mm -hmm. hopefully that right. they they have learned right. and talk to family members talk to their own communities sure. and so i i think in participating with Bridge for Unity and other types of uh, dialogue practices around race and around our differences that it enables us to utilize, learn those skills that we, we actually take for granted that we think, oh, well, I know how to talk. Mm -hmm. But there's an actual, um, no. you know, skill, there's a knowledge base right. that we don't necessarily teach mm -hmm. in college classes, right. in our high schools, et cetera, mm -hmm. to learn how to talk across these differences and across racial lines. Sure. And you talked about, you know, that most of the people within the group were progressives and that was your, you know, th the basis of your skepticism. But just because somebody is willing to talk or engage in dialogue, does that does not necessarily mean that their education is some is entirely complete. Exactly. As right. the kids say, you know, we believe that we're all woke. <laughs> right. And mm -hmm. what, what do we do with that knowledge? Yes. Right. You know, we're, we realize that there are problems in the world, that there are problems in terms of uh, race. I mean, we just need to look at, once again, we have, um, you know, killing of young black men or mm -hmm. shooting of, of young black people. And we have to ask ourselves why, you know, our uh, police forces and uh, uh, why, why they have these biases, right? Right. right. And um, again, I feel that talking to other liberals, let's say, or other folks who, who feel they've reached this kind of plateau of knowledge is really important because we have to, to critique that and say, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the next steps? We realize these biases are there. We right. realize these problems are there, that the biases then affect action. Mm -hmm. What do we do next? And I think mm -hmm. that's a real critical part of our conversation, yeah. that we, um, a, a lot of the people of color, but I have to say a lot of, of the, the whites within the, within the group as well, are asking what happens after this, right, exactly. this dialogue. Right. And, and that is exactly my next yeah. question as well. Like, you know, if given all the structural disparities, given all the institutional racism that currently exists. Is there value in dialogue in and of itself? Or it's just an empty exercise if it does not lead to collective action, especially by participants who are engaged in the dialogue process? What would, how would you respond to that? No, there's definitely a value in dialogue in and of itself. Like mm -hmm. I said, we don't necessarily come with the tools. Mm -hmm. um, we assume we do mm -hmm. um, because we can talk and we can speak. Right. Uh, we come with the tools and how to listen to one another and how to listen to one another where um, I really hear your story and understand your pain and your joys. Sure. You know, what is that like to live in your skin, mm -hmm. to live in who you are. I come as a woman that looks like myself but identifies as an African American woman from the South mm -hmm. living in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. You know, it has its own um, uh, uh, particularities sure. within that narrative. And I think it's really important that we learn how to, to listen to one another's stories in that way, intently, intentionally, um, and then maybe it won't be the same person in front of you but there might be an instance where you have a choice to make in terms of bias bias um you know institutional or otherwise and what are you going to do with that right. so you can definitely there's a moment in which these dialogues uh once again we humanize one another but i think it takes it the next step and there's a lot of intentionality within that process so yes there's a value in dialogue training, but there's also the value of 
pushing us further, challenging us to say what, what happens next. Great. And Professor and Dr. Green, how would you respond to that? Well, I would say that dialogue is a tool. It's a tool in peace building. It's a tool in bridging divides. Mm -hmm. It's a tool in um, community members understanding each other. And it's not an end in itself. It's a, it's a process. And this group has come together with the stated purpose of dismantling racism, at least in our own communities. And mm -hmm. we're going there. But I think the fact that we're going there together is what matters, because mm -hmm. if we can do this kind of bridging work together and develop in the coming years a project that will do our bit in dismantling racism together as a mixed group, we're setting a model Absolutely. for what we would like people to do in this country, how people can be responsible, and how they can do this together. And I think without the dialogue, that wouldn't have happened. Absolutely. So I see that it's a tool and it's mm -hmm. a process that we're engaged in, and this is our first year. And when we reconvene again in September, it'll be our second year, and we'll be f figuring out what's our focus, what's our activity, and how do we do it together. Right. Excellent. And we'll talk yeah. about the collective action that will sort of yeah. hopefully come out of this. Yeah. Uh, but I do want to sort of talk about why is race such a difficult issue to talk about? Well, I want to say before we get that one more thing in terms of what Dee said that I agree with, that what we hope is that people take this to their workplaces, their homes, and their mm -hmm. communities and either facilitate formal dialogues on their own because they have a model now to see the skills or the informal conversations that need to happen. The, the whistleblowing, the stopping, the calling people out, finding ways to do that, finding ways to stand up against racism every place they see it in their communities and families. And without the tools and skills, it's very hard to do that. Sure. People either get angry and attack or mm -hmm. they withdraw. Absolutely. And we're, we're wanting to model a third way, a, a way of dialogue. Right. Right. And so. with that, it's, you know, we don't have the language anymore mm -hmm. to even talk about race. Yeah, that's right. So it's you go into, you know, why is uh, race uh, and racism uh, so entrenched within our culture? We've lost, uh, in many ways, the, the ability to talk, again, across those differences because yeah. we've lost the language, right. which is a tool. Sure. And so um, I think it's really important, again, to participate in the process because mm -hmm. racism, I mean, our, uh, the foundation of our, our, of our country mm -hmm. is built, unfortunately, mm -hmm. on those differences. And, you know, black people being uh, formerly enslaved black, you know, Africans, three quarters of a person, Absolutely. you know. Yeah, exactly. so, so our country is, is built on that basis and we have a lot of work to do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So then why is race such a difficult thing to talk about? Well, it feels to me like everyone's afraid of saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. It's people are sensitive and can get hurt and we don't people don't always know that they're saying something that's appropriate or maybe out of context or or um, harmful to others and that's a struggle and part of that comes as Dee said we don't even know each other anymore we live in separate communities there's not a lot of cross fertilization in terms of our social lives and our family lives and so that's another way in which we've lost the conversation and lost the language and we're out to repair that and, and this is tiny, but we're out to set a model. We're educators. D and I are educators. So basically what we want to do is to use this as a model to push it, to learn for ourselves and then to push it out into the community. And, and to say to people, this is essential. We have to do this. We cannot get to know each other. We cannot be sensitive to how it feels to be in someone else's shoes unless we build a real eyes out relationship which we can do in dialogue. It's and very intimate right. and very honest. And just um, every conversation um, and Really, you know, as, as educators, every course should include some conversation right. around race. Mm -hmm. uh, I teach about film and television and popular culture, and um, my courses always uh, really include intersectionality, mm -hmm. whether it's about race, sex, class, gender. Oh. Um, and so my students understand at the beginning uh, within my syllabus, this is what you're going to talk about. So get ready. And as we do that, I applaud their their courage. Right. Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing within Bridge for Unity is not easy. Right. And people have to be, um, they, they really have to be brave. They have to be courageous, I feel. People of color um, have done this for 
uh, hundreds of years, yes. um, and we've had to put on, you know, uh, our, our armor, so to speak, and prepare daily for everyday, um, you know, uh, acts of, of racism, large or small. And so we're asking within Bridge for Unity for people of privilege to come in and kind of wade in those waters mm -hmm. with us Absolutely. and take a risk and see hopefully the the transformational nature of having these conversations but it is a risk and yeah. you do have to have a, a little bit of courage uh, to step into that and um, I think it's rewarded on the other end my you know the the saying uh, uh, within activism is is of course my freedom my emancipation is bound up in That's yours right. yeah. and I think we see now yeah. within this nation yeah. that certainly our emancipation uh, is going to be bound up in uh, everyone's freedom Absolutely, so. absolutely. And I think what uh, a point that you both touched upon is so critical is not having the language to sort of speak about these issues mm -hmm. and perhaps having them be taught at the college level or even earlier so that when, you know, young minds are being socialized into these things, they know how to have that conversation. And the intimidation that you said some participants feel mm -hmm. in having this conversation around race and saying the wrong thing, that would not arise if people were sort of equipped with the right kind of language and the right kind of approach to sort of engage around these issues. Well, it may more, still arise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in a more ideal world, we live together, be in school together, be exposed right. to each other from the mm -hmm. get-go, and we should start teaching these skills and conflict resolution skills mm -hmm. to little children and right. teach them all the way through school, and yeah. we, we've missed the boat on that one. And I think it makes us um, very stilted as adults in trying to come to these conversations because we're bewildered. And, and people can't even talk in their families, whether it's about race or right. politics or class or whatever, we don't talk to anybody about these issues. And, and I think Dee is right that it takes a lot of courage for all of us. Every month we're there, we show up, we meet together, we, we're forming bonds, we're coming to care for each other. That's, that's really very, it's a great privilege. For me, it's a great privilege personally. Right, right. to do this and we trust one another you know yeah. and the thing is I, yeah. I don't want us to be disillusioned um, that we're not going to feel uncomfortable there's a level of discomfort that we have to just get used to yeah. particularly if we want to solve these problems that um, are, are facing us today within this nation you know whether it has to do with class whether it has to do with you know gender uh, sexual orientation mm -hmm. or particularly race that has right. been long-standing yeah. we have to get used to the discomfort and say we're going to again be courageous mm -hmm. and try to figure it out mm -hmm. um, in a, in a way that hopefully won't increase conflict. Yeah. And discomfort in the context of this particular dialogue group. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what does that look like? And why, where is that existing? Like, that, that level of discomfort? Where is that tension that continues to exist despite the fact that you've all been meeting for, you know, quite a while now? Well, we don't know each other's life stories. Mm -hmm. We're just learning each other's life stories. We don't know what people have done um, how they've been hurt, how they've experienced it, how they've been raised in terms of the values traumatized. around race, how right. they've been traumatized. Um, I think for African American people, they don't know the history of the white people in the group either in terms of what the European American people have done in this, in this area, uh, what their experience is. So we're, we're, we're starting on kind of a, in interpersonally a blank slate in terms of getting to know each other mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and having to build relationships and build trust and I feel like we started last September maybe something like that and so it's almost a year there's a it's different now mm. than it was it's more trusting it's more honest and it's more difficult because we're telling more truth right right delving deeper we're, del we're delving deeper it's it's intense, and when we have the South Carolinas and the Kentuckians here, we'll have three days all day to be doing this and yeah. delving even more deeply and then looking there at what are the differences and the similarities and what are our experiences and how do we take this nation forward? How do we take ourselves right. forward? Right, right. And to be honest and to be truthful, um, those, th when you talk about the difficulty and, and the discomfort, mm -hmm. that's when it comes in. But, you know, you, you have to build some trust that we'll get through this together, um, which is really important. 
And, and how did that work for you? I mean, bec given your initial skepticism, and how has the trust that has developed allowed you to perhaps open up a bit more? And you know, what were some of the techniques used to build that trust, whether formal or informal? So there's different ones, and maybe you can speak to the techniques because we did some different exercises within mm -hmm. South Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, one that I recall that I, I thought was really helpful in opening up um, a lot of discussion, and um, there were the cards mm -hmm. that we utilized, and um, there were cards that were developed by another uh, group that does dialogue uh, training, but I, I thought they were really helpful in getting things going because you sit together and there's this level of politeness mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. we're taught yeah. <laughs> to be yes. polite to one another right. and some things are just rude to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, and so the cards um, enabled us to get past that and some of the things that were on the cards, um, there were cards that were given to people of color mm -hmm. and then there were cards that were given to people who identified as white. And those cards differed in terms of uh, their questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm trying to remember one of the the questions on the card, and I, I can't right <laughs> now. But um, do you remember one no. of the questions? So, but they were they were about differences. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, maybe it had to do with why are you so afraid of um, black men or or mm -hmm. something? You know, something. Uh, that kind of cuts to the core right, because again right. we're trying to break through yes. um, you know being polite to one so another. So politically incorrect prompts yes. that would allow yes. you to then just speak your heart yeah. and, yeah. You know, right. and, and, and cut sense, through the That express negatives. a level of honesty right. not for everybody that sure. doesn't mean that that because we're basically just choosing these randomly yeah. but mm -hmm. some of the things that might come up in discussions uh, uh, across racial lines sure. let's say. Yeah. Yes. And it gave people a chance to, to say, what do you want to say to each other? Right. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to ask of each other? Right, right. You know, and it was kind of permission, which, which the whole dialogue process does, with or without exactly. the hard exercise. What is it you need to say? Exactly. How do you want to be seen? How do you want to see others? What are the silent questions that you haven't asked? What are the emotions that are arising for you at mm -hmm. the moment? Mm -hmm. And talking about them and surfacing them. Which is why it's an exercise for the brave. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It really it is. is. Yeah. It does yeah. require a lot of courage. And so, um, you know, uh, Paula, in terms of you engaging, and you, you, you had a mixed group of people, um, and but we often hear from, uh, you know, our African American members of the African American community that they are tired of educating white folk around issues of racism and around issues of race and that they need to educate themselves around these issues mm -hmm. before they engage. Did you encounter some of that within the group dynamics? Well, first of all, to say that um, there is always an African-American co-facilitator with me, mm -hmm. whether it's in South Carolina or whether it's here in Western Mass, so that there's two of us planning the questions, teasing them out, reviewing mm -hmm. them, wondering what are we going to do next, what's the right direction, where do we go? So it's not just my perspective, which would not be a good thing at all. Um, and what I found was that uh, people were ready to go very deep in this group. They they were ready for the hard questions. They didn't want to sit around and make small talk. This is not why we're there. Mm -hmm. When I went to South Carolina, I thought, well, I have three days, and I could spend the whole first day doing sort of simple exercises to get people ready and I thought no I'm going to plunge right in because we don't have the time mm -hmm. and the very first question was what were your experiences of race um, as you grew up what do you remember from your childhoods and your early adult life and that was true for whites blacks and indigenous people we have people in mixed groups mixed mm -hmm. parts of the country and mixed races and and uh, it took hours to talk about that wow. So once it starts to surface, there's all kinds of things that people can ask each other. And those were small groups of four that's pretty safe and a good place to kind of test out your, your wings of asking questions and responding to others. Sure. And what about you, Demetria? Did you, did you have that sense of, you know, why am I here educating Oh, totally. This larger community <laughs> about, you know, issues But, you know, you have to understand as um, a black person in America, mm -hmm. or I think a, a person of color in America, that sits, uh, you know, literally at tables with where you're the racial minority mm -hmm. most often, that 
we're used to that dynamic yeah. mm. that, okay, once again, this is going to be a moment in which I have, I have to make a choice. And uh -huh. I think it is a choice. Yeah. Do I share some of myself that will basically help these folks, you know, learn more about me and about uh, my my racialized experience, mm -hmm. and um, there there were certainly those moments. The hope, and I think uh, what I experienced at least in my my small groups was that um, I also uh, was able to learn and um, learn kind of the individualized experience of, of the, the folks who participated mm -hmm. in, in Bridge for Unity, mm -hmm. um, as well as them learning about me. And that in and of itself was extremely helpful because what I learned is that here we have maybe some class dynamics or mm -hmm. how yes. this person experienced growing up in a, mm -hmm. in a rural area mm -hmm. that was very similar to my parents perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, or my own working class background and I could identify with that and how they were shaped as, as this human being. Mm. You know, so I, I think that it's it's reciprocal, sure. but we don't often get to feel that as, as a, a person of color right. because there may be 10 <laughs> folks literally at that table and there may mm -hmm. be only one of us. And right. so it is, we get exhausted. Sure. But I, I think uh, having these opportunities in smaller groups um, where again, folks are willing to take the risk and to share that um, that in and of itself will, will help us uh, learn and to once again say that our liberation is tied up in yours mm -hmm. And refuel us sure. because we, we need to nurture that as, as folks here in the United States wanting to make this nation better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People of color, yes, we're, we're exhausted. But I think now more than ever, this nation needs us. But we have to be appreciated for, for what we're giving back in terms Absolutely. of education, uh, you know, talking about just kind of spiritual renewal and mm -hmm. the intelligence that we have brought since being brought to these shores um, that it's needed and so we're going to have to work together but we need co-conspirators right. i like to say it's uh -huh. not necessarily the allies that i think mm -hmm. um, we assume that through dialogue we're building this allyship mm -hmm. We need folks who are co-conspirators, and what I mean by that, they are willing to do the work to organize, mm -hmm. right, to really work in terms of changing institutional right. biases right. Right. and racism, but as well socially and economically. So I think, you know, we have to think of it that way, Absolutely. that the hard work is, is really recruiting co-conspirators in right. right. this noble cause, so to right, speak. Right, right. <laughs> so. And so speaking of dismantling racism and institutional racism, Paula, I mean, where, where do you hope will result from this experience? Well, I want to say in terms of what Dee was saying, we're in this together. We can't do this alone. Either, either race can do it alone. That what, what has to happen to change the institutional and structural um, racism in this country requires all of us and all of our hands and for me the fact that we're doing this together is the only way to, to really do it because I, we don't know each other otherwise we can't speak for each other otherwise sure. and there's no bridging without someone at the other end of the bridge <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so absolutely. we're we're meeting and we're meeting in the middle of the bridge here and doing what we have to do so what I'm what I hope we're gonna is gonna come for this I'm hoping that um, we're focused right now on June because we've got a very big group coming and we've got a lot of planning to do and and we want three very successful days with sure. our South Carolina and Kentucky partners and then we'll have a summer break and my hope is that in the fall that we'll be looking at what do we do together? How do we take this out into the world? Sure. And, and, and Dee and Shabazz have both talked about our own community and how much is needed right here in the sure, valley. And sure. there's plenty to do here, and that's probably where we'll start because that's a, right. a good place. And the reparations talk last month stimulated more questions. Mm -hmm. We want to work on that. So we don't know what the issue is, mm -hmm. but my hope is that our passions and our caring about each other is going to take us into a very strong action come next year. It's yeah. unpredictable what it's going to be. And I, and I also want that for South Carolina and for Kentucky. In Kentucky, they've never had a Martin Luther King Day. Wow. Because there's very few black people, and they're terrified to be out. They're afraid sure. they're going to lose their jobs or their housing. 
they're doing one now. They're planning for it because well, they true. had this experience with us. That's incredible. So that's we're wanting to plant seeds in all three states where we are. Great. Well, yeah. thank you both so much for your insights. You. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Otherwise, we could have talked all day. So thank you both so much. Until next time, this is your host, Mehla Kasandani.